Good morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. This is Jonathan Chapman filling in for Pastor Jim this morning. Although we have yet to experience the birthday of our country that occurs this coming week, it is worthy of both note and thought. As we stand on the verge of the 155th birthday of our nation, to some, that may seem a vast period of time, but put it in perspective. We're a young nation, a nation that in many ways is still trying to find itself, still in the process of growing up, and as nations go, still in its youth. And let's look at it this way. Our country was only founded 57 years before Pastor Jim was born. Doesn't that shed a whole new perspective on the relative age of our confederation? Throughout our short history as a nation, we become known as a peacekeeping country rather than a warmongering nation. We're also known by many in the world as a nation of apologists. By that I mean Canadians have historically apologized for our behaviors, often to the point where if you don't hear the word sorry at least once a day, you may wonder if you've been mystically transported to the location of another country. Our national identity, in a large part, being based on our historic behaviors, having been known as fair, kind, and a polite nation, sharing one of the longest undefended borders of any country in the world. A little known fact is that Canada is one of the most educated countries in the world. Canada has in reality a 99% literacy rate and more than 50% of our population have had post-secondary education. However, as with any country, we do have our challenges. With each new generation of Canadians, moral principles, values, and behaviors have dramatically changed over time. This is evident in the evolution of our national anthem, where changes over the years have been made more reflective of changing social and societal behaviors in our country. But today, I want to talk to you about our dual nationality and the comparison between the two nations of which we belong. As a boy growing up in Calgary, we would start each school day with the singing of our national anthem along with an opening prayer. Our dual nationality was acknowledged in the original words of the song, O Canada, that eventually became our national anthem. Our dual nationality was acknowledged in the original words of the song, O Canada, that eventually became our national anthem. However, few in our current day would recognize or even acknowledge the fourth stanza of that French hymn. It said this, Ruler Supreme, who hearest humble prayer. Hold our dominion within thy loving care. Help us to find, O God, in thee, a lasting rich reward. As waiting for the better day, we ever stand on guard. O Canada, glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Yes, there is no doubt of our dual nationality that was comprised of our Canadian citizenship and that of our Heavenly Fathers. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Philippians 3, verses 18 to 20 says, For as often I have told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 11, it says, We live for a short time in these physical bodies, anticipating the bright future of our real home. While here, we share Abraham's experience, living like strangers in a foreign country, looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. It continues, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So I'd like to spend these next few minutes with you in drawing those comparisons and setting a framework for both loyalties and behaviors attributed to our dual citizenship. The first I'd like to speak on is the character of our two nations. Now, Canada is a constitutional monarchy, meaning that its executive authority is vested formally in the Queen through the Constitution. So every act of the government is carried out in the name of the Crown, but the authority for those acts flows from the Canadian people. Now this is far different from our heavenly kingdom that necessitates the allegiance of all citizens to the one true God. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, it says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to, to be inhabited, I am the Lord, and there is no other. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Another distinction is the currency of our two nations. Now, legal tender is a form of money that the courts of law are required to recognize as satisfactory payment for debt. Canada decided to start using the dollar instead of the sterling pound due to the dissemination of the so-called Spanish dollar or peso in North America during the 18th and 19th centuries. The Canadian dollar was established within Confederation in 1867, and Canada began issuing its own coins shortly thereafter. But by the mid-20th century, the Bank of Canada was the sole issue of currency, and banks ceased to issue banknotes, which were commonly used at that time. Now today, the Royal Canadian Mint is the Crown Corporation responsible for minting and distributing Canada's circulation coins. Over 1 billion circulation coins are minted each year at their high-tech plant in Winnipeg. On the other hand, in our heavenly kingdom, the only legal tender for payment of debt is through God's sacrifice of his only son. Love is the currency and the legal tender in our heavenly kingdom. 
In Romans 13, 8, the King James Version says it this way, Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, I believe the command to owe no one anything is not necessarily to be read as a command to Christians never to borrow money for any reason. Most of us know what mortgages look like and what credit cards look like. But the sense in the Greek is that we should not let any debt remain outstanding, that we should not keep on owing anyone for anything. In other words, we pay back what we owe in a timely manner according to whatever agreement we've made. Or, put another way, that we not live lives of constant dependency, borrowing, or unreliably taking others' money without counting the cost. So Paul isn't primarily concerned with money here, as the following verses in that passage show. He wants to talk about our obligation as Christians to love other people, including our neighbors. He says that loving others is a debt we will never pay off. We will never be done. I want to talk about the privileges of citizenship in our two countries, our two nations. Becoming a citizen of Canada isn't easy, even though Canada has one of the highest ratings for immigration of refugees. But the advantages of Canadian citizenship are many, and they are highly valued where many have been displaced by distress in their own home countries. In our world, we're experiencing massive numbers of displaced peoples. The UN Refugee Agency reports that there are 89.3 million people worldwide who were forcibly displaced at the end of 2021 as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or events seriously disturbing the public order. Our news reports even this last week say that the rate of growth in refugees is faster now than it was even in the early days of World War II. Add to this that more than 13 million people have fled their homes since Russia invaded Ukraine, with more than 5 million that have left for neighboring countries, while 8 million are thought to be displaced inside the Ukraine itself. When we grasp the reality of what's happening, we see that 90% of Ukrainian refugees are women and children. And by March 24 of this year, more than half of all children in the Ukraine had left their homes, and a quarter had also left the country. Those of us who are born in this country may not realize how privileged we are to become a Canadian citizen. Most applicants must be permanent residents of Canada, which is in itself a complex requirement, having lived in Canada for at least three out of the last five years, having filed their taxes, passed a citizen test, and proved their language skills in either English or French. The whole process at best takes about two and a half years in the normal course and the best of times. But by contrast, let's look at how Paul viewed Roman citizenship in comparison to his citizenship in the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. Unlike others in his time who had to buy their citizenship, such as the Roman commander that's referenced in the 22nd chapter of Acts, Paul was born a Roman. That's what it tells us in the 16th chapter of Acts. In fact, his citizenship is explicitly stated in the scripture and was something that Paul used on occasion to his great advantage. See, the emperor Pompey made Cilicia a Roman province in 64 BC. Its capital, Tarsus, was a free or self-governed city from the time of Augustus. We're not told how Paul's parents became citizens of Rome. We do know that he was a Roman citizen by birth, which was a privilege that many didn't have. 
Some could buy Roman citizenship, or it could be granted by the emperor. And the privileges of Paul's citizenship explain how he escaped flogging and was able to appear for a hearing before the emperor Nero in Acts 25. But God used Paul's background for his glory. And Paul testified in Galatians that God sent me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. So with his Jewish upbringing and his knowledge of Greek culture, Paul was prepared for ministry to both Jews and Gentiles throughout the Roman world, ideally suited for his ministry. Paul's status as a Roman citizen by birth benefited him greatly as he traveled on his missionary trips to fulfill Jesus' words that he would be a chosen instrument to proclaim Jesus' name to the Gentiles. So Paul reminds us of how important our heavenly country is when he says in 2 Corinthians, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, even though Paul valued his eternal kingdom so much more than his earthly birthright, he still tells us in Titus to remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. When we see the ills of this world around us, the controversies within our country and with our country neighbor to the south, Paul's advice is hard, but it's very good for us today. So we need to remember our true citizenship. Peter reminds the brethren that their citizenship is in heaven. He says they are sojourners and exiles. The world is not our home. So we should not live like our ultimate treasure is anything more than temporary, whether it's good, bad, or neutral. As it pertains to Christian and politics, we're told to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And that's really important. We're used to thinking of drunkenness and sexual immorality and the like in relation to that phrase, but it's equally applicable to political zealotry. Too many of us indulge the passions of the flesh when it comes to treating our representatives or candidates like either messiahs or devils and assuming laws and leaders in our land itself is the hope of our world. All of this is passing away and we ought to treat it like it is. And yet Peter is not necessarily advocating withdrawal from the system. He is advocating honorable citizenship, a participation that commends the gospel of the kingdom. The level of political participation will vary from Christian to Christian, culture to culture, as conscience and conviction demands. Even in my own family, my uncle Ed Benoit served for many years as a member of the Alberta Assembly. We know that Dr. Hansel, who was once the president of Alberta Bible College, also served as a member of Parliament. Certainly, there's no biblical legality for voting or non-voting, politicking or not politicking. So we're guided by the Spirit in the matters on which the Scriptures are silent. But whether we vote or don't vote, campaign or don't campaign, let us do all things to the glory of God. This means at the very least, living upright, honorable, charitable, and respectful lives as witness to our real citizenship. In Paul's words, we must not slander anyone and must avoid 
quarreling. So we're to obey God first and foremost. Live as servants of God, Peter says. And here we get another perspective on what it means to live as people who are free in a politicized world. It means participating respectfully, but it also means living as those whose ultimate allegiance is to God and not men. In the fifth chapter of Acts, verses 27 through 29, it says, when the apostles were brought before the authorities to be reminded of the law, restricting their freedom to preach the gospel, the answer that the apostles provided wasn't avoidance or submission. They say, we must obey God rather than men. Peter closes this way. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. The church is distinguished as being owed love, not because all others do not deserve love, but because our eternal nation of faith as a family of faith that receives a special loving allegiance above the world and its rulers. The gates of hell will prevail against the gates of cultures and kingdoms, but not the church. And Peter identifies our love for our church family and the honor kind of love for everyone else. Where is our reverence? Where is our worship? Where is our affections due? These are all due to our gracious King of our nation, our heavenly nation, who loves us, saves us, redeems us, and promises all glory to come. Now, as we approach our communion time, we resolve to be honorable citizens of Canada in this world because we are citizens of another. And we resolve to boldly speak truth to power because we must obey God rather than men. And we resolve to know nothing except Christ and him crucified because he is the hope in our politically disastrous world. The importance of the church and the fundamental purpose of it is to keep pointing away from the world for the hope of the world. While everyone else points to government, family, good deeds, and whatever else, the church keeps pointing to the heavenly power of grace as the hope for our problems, for our world, and for our hope. In many ways, God's model of the family has served well in our understanding of our Father and His Son, Jesus, being the only begotten Son of the Father and the Church being the Bride of Christ. And it is His name that we gather and share at His table together now. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we take time this week to celebrate our nation, its history, and what good things might arise out of its existence. But we will not forget, Lord, our true reality of eternal citizenship in your kingdom. We'd ask you, Lord, help us to participate well in your kingdom. Help us to invite others, other refugees from life, other refugees from the lies of the world to come and join us in your kingdom. Help us to extend that invitation to all with whom we come in contact. We are so grateful, Lord, that you have provided for our salvation through the gift of your Son, and it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Let us now partake together as we listen.
Thank you for joining us this morning. Pastor Jim will return next week. It has truly been an honor to be able to spend this time with you this morning. So may God bless you this week. May you have a celebration with your families, your friends, and our fellowship. And may all things be done to his glory. Amen. with paying love to one another.